This is the Hidden Roles Podcast. By Dungeon Masters, for Dungeon Masters. We are going to give you a peek on our side of the table so you can see inside our notebooks and what we've been doing on our side of the screen. Now, let me roll my 20. Okay, check my table. And my guest this week is... Howdy, I'm Lion from Lionhead Gaming, the DM of the Heroes of Thylea actual play and podcast. Now, fair warning, if you are a player in any of my games or in Lions games, and you listen to this, nice characters you've got there. Be a shame if something happened to them. Yeah, so once again, let's have you introduce yourself for the people who are listening wherever they are listening. You say, this is... Who are you? <laughs> I am the Lion of Lionhead Gaming, uh, or you can call me Jordan. You know, or is fine. But so, where where does that come from? I'm just curious. So, the Lion, and and dude, awesome that we're starting with the. That's that's important here. Not a lion, <laughs> the lion. But uh, yeah, so how how that come to be? Uh honest to god i i just personally really enjoy lions it's just my favorite animal and uh you know i i kind of liked fable too uh mm -hmm. you know, if you remember lionhead studios they don't really exist anymore but mm -hmm. uh you know i liked uh you see like lion heads as uh emblems and uh heraldry all the time and you know it all just kind of meshed together into just yeah i'll start lionhead gaming that is this is mine it, I, I dude, the logo is awesome, by the way. I, I love the logo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it's very ecstatic to get it. <laughs> so, uh, does your, does this, so this is just the getting to know you part. Uh, does mm. your, uh, troop, you, the game, the, uh, do, you, you had mentioned it, um, before and for the folks that are listening in the pre-interview part, um, what was the name? What's, so what's the team's name or what's the group's name? Uh, it's more partnership, uh, really, uh, because Lionhead Gaming is a venture with myself, mm -hmm. uh, and my wonderful, oh, so very supportive wife, mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of our, like, pet project. Um, the troop that we play with mm -hmm. are our long-term, uh, you know, going on a, about half a decade now, friends, mm -hmm. uh, who... Are happy to support and be a part of it mm -hmm. uh but it's really something that uh her and i uh do the nuts bolts and uh you know nose on the grindstone part of okay very cool so what was your first tabletop role-playing game that you ever played <laughs> this will probably age me a little bit uh in the opposite way that that's normally used <laughs> uh fourth edition D D, actually okay so what got very you first experience so so were you aware of tabletop rpg as a thing before then or was that something that this was like oh wait this is brand new how'd you how'd you come how did this enter into your yeah. sphere so like my adolescence uh was colored by um trading card games right like Yu-Gi-Oh, pokemon magic mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff right mm -hmm. and those things usually have events at game stores right and so then through that uh plus some stuff with like real-time strategy games i got more familiar with things like warhammer and 40k and you know those sort of um war game things right mm -hmm. and then of course D D is like this thing that's kind of like chapstick <laughs> where it's just like you know you, you you know it exists it's out there but there's like there's other brands there's like carmex or something right uh so <laughs> so i was aware of D and I was aware of its influence on like the world and stuff uh you know but it was before my time right mm -hmm. uh and so i you know i just got introduced uh to D and like on a, hey, let's play kind of basis uh, by somebody I was going to school with uh, when I was going to technical school. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he and I were playing magic and stuff all the time. Uh, he was like, hey, you know, I also have like all of this D&D &D stuff I brought with me. Do you want to learn how to play D&D? &D? Would that interest you? I was like, heck yeah, I love fantasy. I, I grew up <laughs> on Lord of the Rings. I have multiple worn out copies of like tons <laughs> of fantasy stuff. Let's go, let's play. 
Very and, cool. And uh, yeah, they pitched four yet, man. And then, so are 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 you still running fourth edition, or did you move up to fifth, or are you playing a different system entirely? Uh, man, if there was a virtual tabletop that really supported it really well, that wasn't Fantasy Grounds, I would <laughs> be okay. still playing fourth edition if I could make it work on a the tabletop platform of my choice. Mm -hmm. But I do play a lot of uh, 5e. I got introduced to that, uh, I want to say four or five years ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, and met some wonderful people on Roll20 and, you know, uh, basically ended up building that friend group I spoke about earlier through these uh, various mishmash games until we had, you know, one consistent uh, interlocked group of about 10 or so people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but yeah, the game I run is in fifth edition. You know, I'm playing some Pathfinder second edition. Uh, you know, and uh, I do a couple one shots here and there when I can and I have time uh, of like other, you know, more indie things. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to like, you know, dip my toes out there. I want to play. Um, I think it's a uh, kick ass sword lesbians at some point. That seems like a really interesting crazy wow. sort of game yeah yeah i'm right i'm gonna write that down <laughs> kick-ass sword lesbians okay kick -ass. yeah and uh lancer like there's some really cool stuff out there that i want to broaden my horizons more on yeah yeah it's amazing how much is out there i mean it's like one of those things like right like like you had mentioned you're a huge tolkien fan right and mm -hmm. there's a lot of great fantasy to uh consume and you don't have to like Tolkien, but you have to at least throw props up and say, like, we wouldn't have fantasy as we know it without him. Him, and you could argue C.S. Lewis, but he was really the first one to write that kind of story that way. And everyone else that came after, uh, Robert Jordan, Rothfuss, uh, you know, Pat Rothfuss, um, um, Brandon Sanderson. Uh, yeah, uh, Sanderson, uh, yeah. Uh, um, What's his face? Uh, little unknown Arthur, uh, George R. R. Martin. You know all those guys. <laughs> um, Who was the one that uh, that that blessed us with Discworld? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All. Oh, he... Yeah. Um, I mean, even I think like uh, even if you extend it out to like like people like Neil Gaiman, you know, it's mm -hmm. like we they would all tie. It's sort of like bands, right? You have to tie it back to the Beatles in some way, you know. Um, but it's yeah. There's so much. There's so many other systems out there just to consume and play with. It's just like man, where do you even start? But it sounds like you should start with culture is iterative. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you make the transition? Uh, so you mentioned you had a, a friend that had all the stuff. Hey, let's play D and D. How did you make the transition to the other side of the screen? What was it? What was the impetus that said, you know what, I want to be? Uh, so part one of the question is what made you want to become a DM? And second question is why did you do that to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like the very first time I DM'd, uh, it was honestly just sort of a challenge of just like, Hey, do you think you can run this dungeon? that I have a, a adventure module book for, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you can handle that? And, you know, I mean, of course I can. Why <laughs> couldn't I? Uh, <laughs> I know how the system works now. I can do this. And, you know, it went fine. <laughs> there were only a few unfortunate deaths and, you know, everyone left with a smile on their face. So That's it's fine. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I realized I, uh, I really enjoyed... Um, taking in the information that was presented and running it through uh, my own way of like looking at the game and looking at the things that I thought were cool and mm -hmm. taking inspiration from other things and trying to deliver uh, something that I thought would be entertaining and like fun and memorable. That, so you got bit by the bug. Yeah, just, essentially. Despite, despite <laughs> all of the... Despite all of the down, all the downside, well, I say downsides, but all the, the masochism that's involved in, be, in being a dungeon master, you decided to keep doing it, it sounds like. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always been relatively creative, mm -hmm. uh, I think. You know, I liked, uh, you know, playing music, uh, you know, doing, uh, writing poetry, short stories, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, and the, something I realized about DMing 
shortly uh, after I started doing it again in fifth edition, mm -hmm. right? Because I only did it for like a, a short, like, hey, let's do a couple dungeons, right? In 4E. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a gap between like, all right, I'm no longer, you know, nearby those people, you know, God bless them. Mm -hmm. But now I, I'm, I'm in a different part of my life and I'm not playing D&D. &D, and then I was like, well, let's see about trying to play D&D &D again, right? Um, but DMing in fifth edition, which I've been doing a lot more of, mm -hmm. I had the realization that um, when you're DMing, for all intents and purposes, you have infinite power. You have <laughs> immeasurable, like, the, 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 the sky isn't the limit. You define what the limit is, right? You are, as, uh, like, Marvel would say, the one above all. Mm -hmm. Everything stops with you. Yeah. And that isn't to say you should see that, in my opinion, as a... Um, <sighs> da, 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 a sign off on being tyrannical no it is quite the opposite yes. it is you are empowered to deliver something for five six seven other people mm -hmm. that they will never that they will hopefully never forget and for, and, the, for the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't want to end up on DM horror stories. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> like, I remember breaking my wrist. I wish I didn't. Oof. Uh, <laughs> Oof. <laughs> I remember seeing Battlefield Earth. Wish I didn't. Oh, God. Um, but yeah, now I see what you're saying. That's actually, I, man, that's a really, really positive way of looking at it. That's really life affirming, actually, man. That's, wow. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah, I mean, we all, I mean, we all joke, right? The DM is God. I mean, that's like mm. the running joke. And for all intents and purposes, like you said, the DM being the ultimate arbiter in everything, yeah, kind of does have that omnipotence, but the idea that you're approaching it from, but this is my, but my job is to serve, to use yeah. this omnipotence for everyone else is, it's, dude, that's actually, that, that's very, I don't know, I got the warm fuzzies now, man. I mean, you know, I don't want to get uh, too off topic, but a real talk, Brian, real yeah. talk. That is the way I see real life, too. But that's a whole other conversation. That's, but that is not. Whew, that, no, but you, you want to invite me to a politics discord or a politics podcast and we can talk about my opinions on benevolent dictatorship. And that's uh, <laughs> uh, that's a whole that's a whole yeah, that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast. Well, I'll yeah, start yeah. that one up later. Um, but no, I mean, d dude, I mean, that's. Uh, yeah, that's just that's just deep, man. I, I'm just it's, my mind is reeling right now because it's just like I think of like how most. Uh, so my wife and I used to watch. So you think you can dance? My wife uh, was a dancer mm. for many many years, and one of the judges on the show said something very very profound, and it was dance does not build character; it reveals it. Mm. And I think you can apply that to just about any activity. If you think about, like, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it doesn't build character, mm -hmm. it reveals it. I think you could almost say the same thing in 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 D and D and role playing in general. Because you think about the people who come to the table and are toxic, it's not like you're not shocked that they are acting this way. You know, it's sort of like a reflection of who they are. I don't know. Maybe I'm just really yeah, it, in a in a weird sort of way. They they don't have as much power, mm -hmm. but players are kind of omnipotent in their own way too, if you really think about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're stepping up to almost infinite possibilities. They're mm -hmm. stepping up to whatever possibilities the DM, you know, permisses, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what you chose to be. Mm. Interesting. Man, we're, we're getting, I wasn't expecting this to be a deep <laughs> thing at all, but man, I, I, I gotta start treading some water here. Um, well, I still, this is, this is, this is going to bode well for the, for the other questions I have coming up here. But, uh, before we get to some of the deeper stuff, uh, mm -hmm. favorite monster. Gelatinous cube. <laughs> and why? I have to know. Now I, I have a very, it's got a weird place in my heart that's very clean and 10 foot cube shaped. But, mm -hmm. uh, because I started playing D and D with the red box. So I think that was second edition, um, which is, so I'm dating myself, but opposite direction, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think I remember there being a gelatinous cube, like, in, like, the early, like, module that you could run by yourself without actually having a dungeon master. They actually had, like, a little, a little adventure you could run by yourself, like a choose-your-own-adventure thing. And I think there's a gelatinous cube in there. And just for some reason, that always stuck with me. I'm like, dude, that's kind of, like, a cool thing. And then you 
now it's just kind of somewhat creepy because it's like, dude, you could just be suspended there, just being dissolved like in a sarlacc pit. Um, why, why the gelatinous cube? Why is it your favorite monster? Uh, I like oozes conceptually, but I really <laughs> like one. No, I do. No, uh, I know. I it's like just like oozes conceptually. <laughs> so, <laughs> just see, this is like, and, and, so why do you like the gelatinous cube? I like oozes. <laughs> and that's the end of I it. mean they're cool. They're yeah. like they're cool in their own special way cuz like dragons are obviously awesome, right? Yeah. Aberrations and all of their ilk are obviously weird and you know various lovecrafty and all that good stuff. You know, mm-hmm. mind flayers are awesome. Beholders awesome. Aboleths awesome. But gelatinous cubes to me they are oozes that have a shape for mm. one. Mm-hmm. In in the in the wide spectrum of all of these various dissolving blobs, you know you have your gray oozes that might hide themselves as walls, but when they are trying to eat you, they're gonna turn back into piles of gray goop and try to eat you. Mm-hmm. But this cube, it just maintains its shape in spite of gravity, in spite of everything around it. It could be floating through space, and it would still be a cube, and. There's that. <laughs> There's the fact that it's perfectly transparent when it's not moving, so you have no way of knowing if it's there. If it's not moving, you can't sense its tremors through the floor. It deals all of its damage in acid, and you know what happens to be immune to acid damage? What? Mimics. Oh, Jesus. You ever just walk into a room and see a treasure chest and, oh, no, it's a mimic. You assume it's a mimic. You're ready for a mimic. You're not ready to walk into the wall of melting goop in front of the mirror, though, are you? Oh, my God. It's, uh, my inspiration for that is inspired in part by the clownfish in the sea anemone. Uh, but imagine the clownfish also wants to eat you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Yeah, you put, you, yeah, and a gelatinous cube doesn't have to be large. It can be as big as you want it to be. Um the final pin for me that like the trifecta uh for the cube for me is i don't i know they're supposed to locomote uh by sliding Mm -hmm. i like my cubes to floop and it's uh it just makes it really like (laughs) Like it just makes them more fun just end over end they just roll at you and it's just amazing and i i love describing a wall of cubes rolling towards you what do you do there's some the D sixes are coming. <laughs> There's a certain beauty to that. I could see that, but man, I wish you could see the smile on my face, dude. <laughs> Hide, putting the mimic Angela. Man, that is. I am not lying, dude. I am. I am stealing that. There's a. I run a game for uh, some friends and their kids, mm-hmm. and I am. I have to use that. Holy crap! That's oh, dude, my that's, gift to you. Wow, dude! Wow. Oh. If I didn't have any other questions and we were to end it there, I would be satisfied just with Jesus, man. That is so good. <laughs> Holy crap! All right, man. That just made my night. Okay. Um. Let's so get it. Let's get a little bit deeper now. Uh. Let's get ourselves behind the screen. So, uh, one thing that, um, w- w- one thing that is. Just about every it, it's funny because I don't think it's ever mentioned in any of the, any of the rule books, but one of the things that every DM should do is run some form of session zero with their players as a means of setting expectations and all of that. So you can get a lot of the uh, you can get rid of you can take care of a lot of you can cut a lot of the problems off before they even start. Right. Just by having open communication with your players. So for you, do you run a session zero? And if you do. What kind of questions do you ask, and what information do you feel like you need when you conduct that um, in order to make for the best experience? Because it seems like that's really where your foundation is, is making sure that your players, which I hope almost every DM has that expectation, but um, because you articulated it so well. What is it that you, what information do you need to get for your session zero in order for your players to get the most out of the game? I got you. I got you. I'm trying to hit this. I'm trying to hit this in sequence because there's a couple things you said there that I mm-hmm. I kind of want to point out. Okay. So, Five uh, E doesn't really provide a whole lot of session zero guidance, but but I am going to shill just for a quick second. Okay, go for it. Fourth edition <laughs> provides some excellent guidance. The first and second dungeon masters guides from 
fourth edition are superb. They are golden tomes of running a good role-playing game that's focused on primarily killing stuff and taking its shit. Mm-hmm. It's, excuse me, can I curse <laughs> on this podcast? <laughs> sorry. No, it's fine, dude. No, no, it's it's fine. <laughs> Trust me. Okay, sorry. Uh, great, great Dungeon Masters guides. Give great guidance and understanding your players, understanding how they want to receive and experience the game, and some great Session Zero guidance. The uh, Pathfinder 2E Game Mastery Guide also does a really good job of this. Just mm-hmm. want to give those some quick shout-outs. But yes, every time I'm running a game, even if it's a one-shot of just like uh, a last... I've made a habit over my last like four birthdays, August 2nd, uh, to run one shots on my birthday for my friends. I don't know why I do this, but I have done it. <laughs> and one of them uh, was for Tomb of Horrors. And that's everything that Tomb of Horrors is. But even for that, I had a session zero of like, hey, let's talk about how this dungeon is not f- fair <laughs> or fun necessarily in the traditional sense right like i want to make sure um i run a session zero every time because i think mm-hmm. the most important component of playing these kinds of games is informed consent okay yeah and you can't have that if you don't talk to your players because having that open communication having that establishment of what the game is about what the setting is like what the power level of the world is like how much is a gold piece actually worth you know these sorts of things help frame and uh structure your game to be i don't want to say impervious but much more resilient and durable against the the fodder of things that sort of chip away at the the the, the base of a uh, a good game mm-hmm. right um if you don't if you don't understand how much you know your money is worth you don't really understand how the world functions right like mm-hmm. What makes for a good tip if you're trying to impress the barmaid? You don't know. What, you know, <laughs> what makes for or a what's confident reward? <laughs> yeah, or what's insulting, exactly. You don't ah, want to hand somebody a 10 GP no. and they never have to work again for the rest of their lives. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I tipped her a copper and you're banned from that tavern for life. <laughs> exactly. Uh... But then, you know, in terms of dealing with players mm-hmm. and informed consent, you want to you wanna use the safety tools that people have uh, spent a, a decent amount of time establishing. Things mm-hmm. like lines and veils are really, really easy. They're so simple to set up at the session zero of just like, hey, what aren't, what, 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 what aren't you cool with? What, what yeah. don't you want to be in the game? You know, like, it's, it's a really easy set of questions. Um, that just makes sure everybody gets to have fun, that you're not going to throw something that you were not expecting. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, let's be frank, we don't, like, even if you've been playing with somebody for 10 years, they may not have revealed everything about their lives to you. Yeah. And that's okay. That's their right. But having a session zero lets them set those boundaries. You know, there are things that I don't want, you know, uh, as a... As an African American, there are certain mm-hmm. things I don't want to deal with in role playing games. Personally, mm-hmm. like there are other people who are of the same uh, race and ethnicity who will be more comfortable with certain things, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. The only thing that matters is, like I said, informed consent. That they understand what. Yeah, everyone understands exactly what they're getting themselves into, and yeah, and then sticking to it because there's a lot of trust there. Exactly. A lot of trust and, and, and there's been a lot of stories in the last year or two of DMs <laughs> like like known famous DMs, DMs. Yeah. yeah that have really <laughs> kind of you know shit the bed on that um, blown their I, whole careers apart yeah <laughs> I I'm, I'm I'm very happy that two of my uh favorite quote unquote celebrity DMs have never done that um <laughs> uh, um uh, Jerry Holkins, Tycho Brahe from Penny Arcade, who I actually have met personally and chatted with him. He's mm. a very, very cool dude. And I, I, obviously Mercer, because he's just... He's dreamy Iconic and he's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I wish I had his hair. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's... It, yeah, it's... You're, it's, you know, it's, when you're, it's when you find out, like, hey, the celebrity I, I, I kind of admire turns out, like, they're like, oh, they're awesome. Like, when you find out Tom Hanks did another cool thing, you're like, oh awesome and then you find out another one's a completely shitty you're like oh man now i can't watch anything you did again um this is why i love dolly parton oh dude dolly parton man let's she's awesome (laughs) 
<laughs> she is awesome. She is awesome. Um, yeah, so that's really that's really imp- you raise a good point for for you know, making sure that your players understand. Or actually, no, it's better that you understand what your players' limits are. And if you have them, that's fine. And they, they understand what yours are too. Yeah. They yeah. no, you're that's another thing. As a dungeon master, like as you, you're omnipotent and all of that, mm-hmm. but you're still a player. You know, there's yeah. um, one of my harder lines personally mm-hmm. is uh actual descriptions of torture it's never something i personally enjoy it's never something i personally enjoy playing witness to participating in or acting out mm-hmm. it's uh for me it's very much i am at the point where i can veil torture i can say all right you do this or this takes place and here are the results of that, mm-hmm. uh, if it's truly necessary. But if I don't establish that at the session zero, and one of my players describes how they want to do something visceral and disturbing mm-hmm. to another person, and I understand, yes, we're playing D&D. This is a game about killing people in horrific ways if you think too long about it. Yeah. But <laughs> it's just something I have an issue with. And so by setting that guideline, even as the dungeon master, and having that communication, mm-hmm. We can, you know, someone can just say, all right, I want to use, you know, in a parody sense, right? Smiles at the table, enhanced interrogation techniques, and we can move forward. That'll be the veil. It's it's no different than saying, all right, me and this, you know, me and this other player will fade to black, you know, and they'll have their romance or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of deal. And that, that line and veil is, it's the the simplest and easiest thing to integrate. There are lots of other wonderful safety tools, Mm -hmm. but if you're like, I don't know, do we really need this? You're probably already using it for some things like, you know, fading to black and not even realizing it. (laughs) I I would actually say to that point, I mean, listen, if you want to run the tabletop version of Saw and that's what your players want, Mm -hmm. then, you know, go for it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, But... Uh, I, f- I'm kind of in your boat of where, for me personally, I th- less is more. Storytelling wise, less is more. If you think about some of the scariest moments, uh, or some of the scariest movies, at least that, for for me, Jaws, and Alien. And in both of those mm. movies, you n- almost never you only get glimpses of the shark. Uh, with Alien, you only get glimpses of the, you know. Your your brain fills in, uh, your brain fills in more terrible things with leaving the blanks there, without actually 100%. filling them in. And so, even from a storytelling perspective, that could be more powerful. Not even saying anything without it being traumatic. It's you know? it's really difficult to beat imagination. Yeah, but it but it you're you, but you're never gonna like. I'm not going to say never, but most people aren't going to like immediately take it to the worst possible scenario and vividly imagine the worst cases of torture ever. They might, but mm-hmm. that's a whole other issue. Um, <laughs> so, okay. We'll so, sit them next to the person yeah. that's uh, making interesting characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so, once you've... Okay, so we got session zero done. What do you do as a dungeon master to prepare for just any session whatsoever so we've it could be let's say we're a few games in so it's not like you know right away where you've got to do a lot of world building and they have you know whatever it is let's say you're several games into a campaign at this point you're starting to hit your rhythm and flow with the with the group what is it that you do to prepare for the game that you've got scheduled for whatever the next game is we have a game schedule a week from now what what would what are some of the things that you would be doing to prepare yourself and get the game and get get the game ready for that night day whatever i say night but you know uh yeah so my dming prep style is um i don't know i guess i would maybe consider it kind of the boring style Mm -hmm. um i have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of digital (laughs) post-its and uh that is essentially how i function Mm -hmm. um so like I have, I'm literally looking at a post-it note right now uh, that's just a list of magical item ideas personalized for my players. I have cool. another post-it note on the other screen uh, that is a series of encounter note ideas for 
uh, the next arc after this dungeon they're in. Uh, so, <laughs> so like a combination of just uh, making sure I always have, whether it be my phone, physical, or the computer, uh, some way to take any sort of crazy idea that sort of comes to the top of my mind as I think about my game just in a sort of... Um, Professor X wearing Cerebro kind of way <laughs> of just, you know, opening your third eye and looking out into your into your world and mm -hmm. seeing what the what you want to have happen and what should happen based on the uh, the player's actions. That's an important component, too. Um, and then just writing it down, <laughs> writing it down in some way, shape or form. It doesn't have to be long form, though. Mm -hmm. I will also do prep that way. I will like if. Uh, I, there was an entire point where my players wanted to do a whole lot of research on understanding the elemental planes. Mm -hmm. You know what I did? I did a fair amount of preparation for mm -hmm. the elemental planes to make I, and that that required me to sit down and ask myself, all right, what what are the elemental planes in my world? What does this look like? How do they interact? How mm -hmm. do they interact with the material plane? A asking yourselves these questions because you're you're essentially getting out in front of what they're going to be asking you mm -hmm. and solving those problems and you don't have to write it all down, right? I know a lot of people really enjoy, like, you know, uh, shooting from the hip DMing of just, like, whatever you're thinking of in the moment and, and running with it. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I will never admonish that. Mm -hmm. If you can pull that off and do it really well and everyone loves it, that's awesome. Yeah. But I'm also going to write down a few bullet points. Yeah. Just to keep my thoughts organized, just so I know I have, you know, keywords to look at to have as jumping off point so I don't misstep or misspeak the world that I'm also trying to build that I want to have make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't want to explain, you know, how something works to your players and they have all of the relevant information and they look confused. Yeah. Unless, of course, you're, you know, like... Unless that's the point. Shattering their worldview and yeah. they're like, oh, we thought it worked this way and now you're telling it works this way. Okay, confusion, right? Or if they don't have all of the information, they're getting, you know, in, uh, you know, my setting is Greek myth, so it's very apocryphal, mm -hmm. very, you know, storyteller. So people aren't going to have the full story. You know what I'm right. saying? Things will get, uh, it's all vocal, passed down, you know, that sort of deal for the most part. Uh, so things get lost in translation, sometimes literally. And that's okay for them to be confused too. But if they have everything in front of them, you want to make sure your stuff makes sense. Yeah. So do you use um, just like the the post-it notes that are in like Windows, or do you or do you have an application? One hundred percent. Okay. Okay. I literally use the post-it notes that are in Windows. Like, like I know, like um, if you're gonna do like the full Monty of like building out an extremely fleshed out setting, I know there's like great tools for that, like World Anvil and stuff like that, and those are excellent resources if you're really you know going super deep with it. I'm personally at like I'd say the midpoint of I am preparing everything I think I need mm -hmm. and everything I know I need. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not going uh, all the way to, uh, you know, writing everything down like I am compiling a book or yeah. a setting book to, you know, make a Kickstarter with. <laughs> <clears throat> Which everyone wants to do now. And sure, why not? Hey, more um, power to them. I'm glad for yeah. it. Um, World Anvil. I think it's the first I've heard of that, but I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, I tend to, I use OneNote myself because I'll just like have an idea of like, oh, uh, this thing just for, it might just be like a story idea or a story hook. Or I'll be thinking, oh, I think this happened in this world's history. So I'll make a little note for myself. Um, but I need, I know for myself, I need to keep it organized differently. My ADHD will just go berserk and I'll be like, wait. Where did I put it? Which note is it? Oh, I deleted it. And, you know, it would be bad. I can color code my post-it notes. That's, <laughs> that's what I do. That, that, would, that would be helpful for me. Um, <laughs> but World Anvil, I like that. And I started actually posting, once information becomes public knowledge to my character or to my players, um, I set up a wiki on uh, Reddit for our game. So that way it's like as we're establishing things, it becomes a little bit easier just to go back and look at those things really, really quick. But I only do that for the public stuff because I don't want to put all my notes there because there's stuff they don't know yet. Um, so when you're actually playing, do you prefer um, tactical or do you perform more theater of the mind or are you some kind of, I mean, I know everything's kind of a hybrid no matter what, 
But do you tend to, on, uh, if we're going to say one end of the scale is completely theater of the mind and the other end of the scale is very tactical, uh, where, do you, where do you tend to like to fall on that scale, um, on, that sliding, on that sliding scale? I cut my teeth and made my entry into the game with 4th edition. Mm-hmm. So I love me some battle maps. <laughs> okay. And you said you were playing like Warhammer before that too. So you probably like there's probably a little bit of a a war game kind war of games, a mentality yeah. for some things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here and there, here and there. I'm I'm more a fan of the 40k uh franchise than I am of the actual war game itself to be right. honest with you. But uh but I do I do prefer uh tactical maps mini. I will use theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. Um for when it makes sense, because it's an excellent tool. There's no reason to cut the tool out of your toolbox. You're not you're not proving anything to anyone. All you're doing is hampering your own ability to deliver the experience you mm -hmm. want to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I uh, I spent I have spent my five e career, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, DMing in a virtual environment, whether it be Roll Twenty or now uh, more prominently. Uh, Foundry Virtual Tabletop, and then of course you know we had 2020, and everyone's getting to learn what that's like now. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about DMing in that environment, or DMing in an environment where you have digital resources available to you if you're playing in person, is if you're doing a theme, uh, a scene as theater of the mind, you can still have supporting artwork. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You can have um, elements and uh, you know music or what have you to amp up the theater mm -hmm. rather than just you know whatever uh uh box text you might be reading or pulling from your own notes or what have you mm -hmm. you know these things can all combine together to make form a memorable experience um but when it comes to the nitty-gritty let's roll initiative time uh, almost 100 percent of the time it's going to be you know very tactical with a battle map here are the monsters here's what you see you know here's some elevation markers that kind of deal of like all right, let's 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 play it out. Um, you like you some grids. That's, I I do enjoy me some grids, much to the chagrin of uh, one of my players who would love it if I were to free him from the car <laughs> the square. But I'll never free you, Brendan. You are trapped until I say otherwise. Um, <laughs> no, no. Be careful what you wish for. Do you wish your character to be free of the grid? Yeah. Cool. Huh? Oh, exist. look. There's Jubilex. No, oh, and God. there's you. <laughs> Congratulations, your character is free of the grid. <laughs> there is a a nice component uh, for theater of the mind. Something that um is always kind of interesting to me, and you'll see this with some recent Kickstarter projects from. Uh, uh, especially from like Matt Koval as of late, he did his mm -hmm. whole Kingdoms and Warfare uh, project, right? People really want to uh, deliver that Peter Jackson, you know, Warcraft, big thousands of people smashing into mm -hmm. thousands of other people feel for their games. They really want to deliver that Warfare feel, right? Yeah. And I get that. I get it a lot. I come from a military family. I enjoy that content as well. However, <laughs> mm -hmm. when it comes to making that work in a Dungeons and Dragons environment, I think there can be some pushback, right? Because it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that you present to your players of like, hey, are you all interested in it? All right. They might be interested in it conceptually, mm -hmm. but how interested are they in actual like warfare rules and like yeah. managing units and playing Total War while they're playing D&D, &D, right? And... I think theater of the mind can make for a excellent uh, bridge between we're playing D and D and also tens of thousands of people are fighting right next to us. Right. And I think using theater of the mind, uh, it's it's kind of my go to strategy for that kind of situation. Of mm -hmm. all right, here's the stuff that you guys are doing. We're high octane. It's on the battle map. Here it is, right? And then depending on how what you're doing is going and maybe the orders you're giving or what have you, um, things around you are progressing forwards, backwards, or not at all, right? And that's mm. the theater that you're playing in. So you're on a battle map. It's yeah. very visceral. You know everything that's there, but you guys didn't stop the dam from you know being blown up in time or what have you and now yeah. the battlefield around you is changing and that'll change the next thing that you're dealing with. And, you know, it's... um. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like my philosophy for encounter building in general and mm -hmm. for like understanding the world in general. And that is 
everything is a dungeon. Everything. <laughs> everything always is a dungeon. And it makes it so much easier to prepare and understand a... Uh, a game, I think, if you look at your world that way. Uh, my players spent 18 days climbing through and up uh, the largest mountain chain in the world while mm -hmm. being uh, pushed down by a supernatural blizzard at the same time. They were in a dungeon. Mm -hmm. And it was awful. <laughs> it was a ton of fun, but it was awful for them because, yeah. you know, who wants to be on a mountain in a blizzard? Uh, and it's the same deal with a big warfare scene, too. You're in a dungeon. What's going on? What you do in, in your individual rooms can have an impact on the dungeon all around you. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it makes it a lot easier to uh, sort of picture and flowchart the whole situation if you take it to what it is you most core understand about the game you're playing. Dungeons and Dragons is about... Dungeons. And dragons. And or... Possibly <laughs> dragons. That's... Dude, that's actually... I like that. That's a really cool... I mean, I mean... I mean, very conceptually, you know, well, yeah, the world's a dungeon, right? But no, I like that. You're breaking it down into smaller pieces like that. That's actually... It makes it a lot easier to prepare, too. Yeah. Absolutely. It makes it, like even the the most crazy and like you know bombastic events, if you think of them like rooms, mm -hmm. it makes it really easy. Man, you're like blowing my mind tonight, dude. This all started with a mimic and a gelatinous <laughs> cube, and that was just that that was just the bottom floor, bro. I'm liking this. This is very cool. I'm, that's because I know like when I when I first got back into D and D, I had taken. Oh man, probably a close to twenty year break from role playing games. Um, yeah, uh, I was I had run a I had run a vampire game in college, and then I really hadn't gone near it. Not because I didn't want to, just I just hadn't had the opportunity to uh, until 2017, 2018, when I got back into it. And I remember just being so overwhelmed. And this is such a that's such right there, just like yeah, just breaking it down that way is oh man. Golden, I love that. You take life day by day. That's yeah, my mom there you go, me. man. We're getting like take... it's not just life advice. Dunge dungeons and life, man. Not dragons. I mean, like honest <laughs> to God, it's it. The overlap is immense, right? They yeah. always tell you what's what is the thing they always say in every rom com to fixing a relationship. Mm -hmm. You need what. Someone Touch to carry the, the idiot ball. I don't know. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> well that too. Uh, no, what was it? I'm sorry. Say again. <laughs> You need good communication. Oh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have to be able to communicate with your partner, right? Mm -hmm. The same principle applies to everything else, mm -hmm. whether it be your boss or your party. Same thing. Mm -hmm. If you communicate, if you're able to effectively communicate as a DM with your players, mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the best things I think I have ever done for my own DMing is I took something that has allowed uh, my wife and I to have, have we've been together for ten years now. Mm -hmm. uh, to prosper as well as we have is that sometimes her and I will just sit down and we'll have what I call relationship checkups where we just talk. We mm. just talk about everything that's happened, what we've been going through, how we feel about different things, and just update each other and express things openly and understand that this isn't a place to really feel a need to be defensive. It's a place to grow so we can continue to be together 10 more years, right? But you do the same exact thing with your players. Mm -hmm. You go on to Google surveys, you make a five question survey, really simple. You ask them, what have you enjoyed? What haven't you enjoyed? What do you wanna see more of? Where do you see your character going? What magic items do you wanna see? Or what kind of powers do you wanna get? Or anything, right? Because there is no, no one knows your players better than they do. Let them tell you what it is they want from you so you can deliver onto them everything and all of your omnipotence that you have. Dude, you got your your fervor got a little uh, little old school. I was raised there. Baptist. I, it, it, I was hearing it there, and I liked it, and I'm here for it, man. Cool. Oh man, this Ugh. is. Dude, hey, can you tell is... that I really like clerics? <laughs> man, Ooh. this is that. I mean, you're. you're you know, I think I want you to be my DM. No, I'm just now. passionate. I just I just yeah, want no, everyone to have a good time at the table. <laughs> yeah, that's that's well. First of all, dude, you and your wife are going to be together forever. It sounds like because that's what you're describing there. Whether it's even just with that. your significant other, 
or your players to get try to, to ask for that feedback or from your boss is scary as hell because you know but it yeah it's it's one of those things that you don't want to live in ignorance and if you go on to like if i whenever i see like um uh like dm academy on reddit like 90% of the questions that are asked that are legit questions, not the, how do I start DMing? It's like, no, we want to help you with that, but uh, Google it. Um, <laughs> but the, for the ones that are, uh, most of the questions are like, dude, communicate with your players. My mm-hmm. players won't stop doing this. Well, talk to them. Did you talk to them? No. Well, <laughs> start there. And, you know. No, that's uh, that's that's it's such that's such a tough thing to do, but that's it, it's so worth it. So, so worth it to uh, to stick your face in the paper shredder and see what happens, because <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what you're doing and hoping is not on. Um, I mean, you know, like you you have to sometimes. You yeah. know, like uh, imagine if a knife was scared. Every time you went to sharpen it, because it was going to huh. lose a little bit of itself. Oh, damn, dude! You, you're, you need to cut things. You need to be sharp, and sometimes that means you have to learn that. Hey, your prose goes on for too long. Sorry. Yeah. We we love the way you described that cathedral, but did we really need to know just how detailed the columns were? They weren't relevant. <laughs> There, there wasn't a puzzle involving the columns. There wasn't a monster on the columns. Mm-hmm. The columns were just columns. But you spent two minutes talking about them. We love you, but, you know, spend your time elsewhere, man. And you see, you Sometimes, just... and that will make a better game. Yeah, and you just got me thinking of a puzzle where you have to turn these enormous columns to the right <laughs> dial thing to make them all open up. That is where... Yep. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, so, something that, um, going back to, like, one of those... Some a lot of the questions that you see out there, and you've probably come across it too, and we all run into it every single time we run the game. Is so, or I, I'll give you another example too. You had actually mentioned about how uh, they wanted to know about the uh, extra planar, the elemental planes, and so you had to start conceptualizing what all this was preparing. Inevitably, what happens though is they ask you the one question you didn't come up for an, with an answer for. Or you plan out an encounter and they come up with the one solution. Or there's always something that the players will do. Damn them. Every time. (laughs) That just completely flummoxes any planning that you've done. And that's, as you mentioned, because they have a world of almost infinite possibility. And you can't possibly conceive of all of that. When something comes up that's more than just a little, okay, I make a little pivot. If something really challenging, not in a bad way. But something really challenging comes up that a player has done. What do you do? What have you done in order to adapt to that? So you can make it seem like, because here's the part, right? Half the time we're flying around holding by the seat of our pants with our hair on fire, but we'll never let you know that we're screaming on the inside. Um, you know, how, how, what do you do to make that seem as seamless as possible that, oh, yeah, I planned for that because that's the trick, right? We didn't plan for it, but we're going to make you think we did. So what are some of the things you do <laughs> when, when a player when a player or players come up with some unexpected solution to a problem? It's all about what the problem is and how the solution uh, actually functions, right? Um, I am, if it is not already clear, uh, an enabler when it comes to my players. <laughs> I want them to have in a, a good grand way. time. Yes, <laughs> but I want them to have a grand oise time in the, the 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 rules and bylaws that I set, right? I consider mm-hmm. myself a lawful neutral person and a lawful neutral DM. I just understand that I define what the laws are. Mm-hmm. So if you have outsmarted me in my encounter and come up with some outstanding solution that checks out, that you haven't broken any rules, you haven't cheated, you haven't bent anything, mm-hmm. I just didn't plan for it. I pass, I, I knock over my king to you. You have done an excellent job. I am proud of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is your time to shine. Well done, players. Well done. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. Yeah. I truly do. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, if there is something that does not work within the laws and you have, you know, you, you, you've you gone too far, I'll remind you of what it is that, you know, we agreed upon and that this doesn't function that way or what have you. I'm sorry. You can take your turn back and you can tell me something different, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> this does um, not hold with the ancient accords <laughs> to which you signed. 
<laughs> exactly. And therefore, there shall be consequences <laughs> to your actions. Oh, I mean, I'm I'm so permissive. You just get to have your turn back. <laughs> wow, um, you you. So if they go and like really just like blow it up, you'll actually. But they get... they misread the last line of the spell because oh. that's every player has the you know we can't finish reading uh, disease. <laughs> wow, you are a merciful DM. Ooh. Yeah, I have infinite power. I can throw nine. I can throw in plus one dragons at you until you die. <laughs> N plus of one. Course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a that's a tech school move right there, man. <laughs> I remember that from stat class. Uh, <laughs> all it's right. Like, you know, I don't have to. I, I, I'll get you next turn. The Baylor will crit you, and you will. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Well, good oh, luck. Don't worry. <laughs> Exactly. No. Um, so is it a case now where it's like when you give them their turn back, they're like, "Oh God, no." I mean, like, <laughs> like usually, usually for me and my players, they're, they're mostly pretty experienced. Yeah. So they'll they'll be able to pivot, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, and figure something out. I'm very much uh, down and open for communication, teamwork, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's you know they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Um, if it's something, let's say, not combat focused, right? Because combat's pretty easy for me to deal with. That's, right. like I said, I cut my teeth on 4E. Combat, I get. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if it's something where they have, like, pointed out something in the world or have, uh, let's say, you know, a really smooth talking bard has mm. outwitted my really smooth talking NPC, right? Mm -hmm. And they have pointed out a, a fatal flaw. They've revealed the murder mystery before it was, before they were supposed mm. to figure it out. <sighs> yes, this is what I want. It is, yeah, like that. Like you know, they figured out who the bad guy is. Here's the here's the trick, right? Mm -hmm. If they have figured out who the bad guy is and they're right, mm -hmm. I hope you've been practicing your poker face. If they can see your face, you need to ride that out. You need to ride out what it is they're saying mm -hmm. and not let it show as best as you can. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't speak too much. You don't speak too little. You have to just it is Maintain. I think you just have to put some ASIs into charisma. You're going to need it. And <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to have to just let them think what they think. Mm -hmm. And try to pull to the next scene. Now, if it is a if it's a big accusatory, you know, they're actually uh, declaring this in character. They're actually Just calling yes. out the the person. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you will hopefully have prepared something as a response. If you haven't, either fold and and play it up from from that point forward. Let them let them take this moment because. It is something that is, um, in this context, even more earned than combat, right? Because mm -hmm. combat is something that we understand. It has a series of binary values. The spell does what the spell says it does. Right. And there are ways to influence and utilize those things to create for situations that the DM didn't plan for, yeah. like Force Cage. and <laughs> <laughs> Or Polymorph. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, yes. Matt? Uh... <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. That was... Oof. When they but... <laughs> when they finally got polymorph, it was just like, wait a minute. And it God, what a broken goddamn spell. Anyway, it just was like Exactly. But it made for fun. Cause I think he turned himself into yeah. Triceratops. It was like it's... I can't say no to that. And then the other one's like, Well, I'm gonna ride the Triceratops. Well, of course you are. <laughs> Oh. I, I would too yes learn to smile when they're smiling uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh but if you're dealing with the situation of like it's just role playing they've made the accusation you mm. don't have something planned i mean unless you're running like a like if you're running like a sherlock holmes campaign where they're going on a series of murder mysteries let them have this one mm -hmm. if they uh it, it's kind of like um it's kind of like what uh, you mentioned him earlier. Um, uh, 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 I actually can't remember his name. The writer of A Song of Ice and Fire. You mentioned him earlier. J oh, J George, R. George R. 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 Martin. Oh, that yeah, guy. I was going yeah. to say, like, yeah. He, he had an interview um, uh, that's been shared a few times where he was talking about if you're writing a story, a murder mystery, where the butler did it, and two books in, people online have figured out the butler did it, and you try to change it so the chambermaid did it, it's going to be obvious. They're going to know. Mm -hmm. They will see where the logical inconsistency 
inconsistencies line up. It's mm-hmm. very difficult to pull that over if they've already reasoned it out because they've already they've already laid out. You know, some, yeah. there's an obsessive player at your table that has all the notes of all the things everyone said, and they already know the butler did it. Yeah. So let them make the accusation, and uh, you're just gonna have to roll with it. There isn't a um, there isn't a golden bullet to this, I don't think, uh, or a silver bullet to this. It is a mixture of depending on your own charisma to weather out uh, player accusations of like, oh, I, I think I think the butler did it, guys. What do you guys think? You think the butler did it? And they're like talking about this at the end of the session. Mm-hmm. You got to ride that out. Yeah. If the players make the accusation in character, you might just have to let them take that win. And that's okay. That's a good thing. But there is a... Um, it might be my own personal shortcoming, but I don't know if there is an answer to it. If there is a perfect solution to them realizing the butler did it early, besides maybe having to end the session and trying to figure out where you're going to go from there. You need, yeah. it's okay. I would say that. that. That's my answer. It is okay to take the time you need to find where you want the, the game and story to go. Right. Because... They're going to be focused on their win. Mm-hmm. They're not going to be focused on you not necessarily not having a perfect answer or the perfect response. You can yep. you can pivot and improvise and have you know the the accused make some uh, grandiose accusation back at them. You can have them try to fight their way out of it. There's lots of things you can do yep. in the moment, and those are great. That that makes for dramatic tension. That makes for you know that moment. They call them out, and he picks up a vase and throws at him and runs. Yep. End of session. That's, cool. Now yeah. we're coming back to a chase scene. Now we're building up the action. Now you know you you you, you change what the um the drama is going to be, and you 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 keep that drama and you build it up into something new, mm-hmm. and you take the time to do it. Do not be afraid to take your time. <laughs> yeah. So I something I started doing. <sighs> oh, Need, you need a breath? Need a minute? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. No, it's like, fine. You really, you really got me really thinking no, about no, like yeah. how to approach that situation. And I mean, it's... It's, it's a situation we all run into, and some mm-hmm. stuff is easy to tap dance around, and that comes back to some of those notes. If you've made, uh, if depending on what works best for you, whether it's very detailed writing or whether it's just quick notes, if you've done enough preparation about the world, you'll be able to tap dance out of a lot of situations. You don't have to have everything written down. You don't have to plan for everything. Just make something up and go with it. And if it dramatically alters things, then, oh, well, go with it. But um, don't worry about it because it's going to happen. It's inevitable. Um, I uh, I started uh, writing out like five scenes that I wanted to play out during a session. We almost never get past three. <laughs> so, no, no. But I, so I'm, I'm not over, I'm not, so I'm not planning out like, you know, like every minute detail, I'm just making little notes like, okay, this scene, ba 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 ba, like two, th- two, three bullet points. So if something happens that I need to do a quick little juggle, I could just grab one of the scene four or scene five and maybe, you know, yeah. and just go it that way. I did have to cut a session short once because they just went on this left turn that I just did not expect and I said uh and we're gonna end the session there because i got nothing <laughs> it's and it's okay to admit that it's fine it's nothing bad happens they'll show up again to find out what you cook up for them um 100 percent, 100 percent. i right. think um i'm gonna go ahead go oh ahead. yeah good no no go ahead go ahead go ahead i i would say um there is a a love uh in D D, right of the the random encounter mm-hmm and I have a love-hate relationship with the, love, with the random <laughs> encounter. I do not care for the random encounter that means nothing. Mm. It has no impact. It, it provides no setting. It provides no uh, foreshadowing. It does nothing mm-hmm. but have you roll dice. And that is the end of it. It is literally, I looked at a table, and this came up, and this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if you enjoy that. It truly is. Yeah. As long as you and the people you're playing with also enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Personally, I don't care for it. But what I do like is a random encounter that will allude to the future. A random encounter that will uh, provide a framing 
thing for things that I am working on in the background, right? And if you're doing something in a sandbox environment and, you know, your players have hopefully uh, agreed as part of doing a sandbox to let you know where it is they want to go in the future. Mm -hmm. So that way you can make sure it's adequately prepared. Mm -hmm. And they decide to throw you the curveball of, oh, crap, we learned something. And now we're going to go in this other direction. We're taking the scenic route. Yep, we're taking the scenic route. We're taking the scenic route to one of those random encounters that I've prepared ah. that alludes to the story, that tells you something more is happening, that provides gotcha. a uh, a blood-stained note about some, you know, trade caravan or what have you. Things that help build out and flesh out the world and show that it's alive and things are happening in other places, mm -hmm. I think is something that is often lost in the chase of, like, what makes for a balance encounter? That's a little bit easier, but like, what makes for an interesting encounter? What it says about the world it takes place in. Right. And so having a good couple of those mm -hmm. to throw in front of your players, because let's be frank, uh, no matter what edition of the game it is or variation, Pathfinder or otherwise, combat always takes forever i'm yeah, sorry no it does. always does 5e 4e pathfinder second edition first edition it doesn't matter combat always takes forever mm -hmm. but it makes for a great uh stop gap for when they decide to take a left turn at albuquerque and go in the wrong direction and it lets you set things up for the future it lets you drop these hints and these allusions to things that the note taker players or the people who are super interested in the lore of your world mm -hmm. are going to be happy to hang on to and they're going to be really happy to see those things pay off and it's 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 perfect it's a tool that lets you buy time and give them happiness because right. who doesn't like a good fight where they can show off their powers exactly. and do cool stuff Right? That's what we're here for, is to be heroes. They get to save some people, do some cool stuff. You get to build out your world a bit more. And you have time to prepare for that city that you didn't think they were going to go to for another four mm -hmm. months. And, and <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's fun to every now and again give them a squash match. Right? Oh, yeah. 100%. Just every 100%. now and again. Just bring in a few jobbers. And it could be <laughs> something as simple as these bandits are moving away from a war. Or they're moving towards a war. Or, yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, just... They're moving. It's going to be complicated. Motivated. Yeah, exactly. Just give them, just give them a couple sentences of motivation. Because if they think those sentences are interesting, if they think, wait, what, what's going on in the Eastern continent? What, why are they going away from this? What, you know, the, if they start asking questions, mm -hmm. if they show genuine interest, and you're in a sandbox game for sure, you already know what you need to start thinking about, don't you? Mm-hmm. All right. So, what I have here now is a question I saw on the Reddit or the subreddit DM Academy, and I saw it this week, and I thought it was very interesting. And it got obviously, it got, obviously this has already been answered because you put it up there, and if it's an interesting question, people answer it immediately. Um, but I thought maybe we could uh, take a shot at this. So the title of this post it is uh, it is from um, posted by the user Zerg Othrax, Zerg Zero Thrax, one or the other. Um, Player wouldn't tell me spells they were attempting to cast to save drowning paralyzed party members. And then uh, the post was, He kept asking what depth they're at, and just that over and over. He never told me the spell, and we both got upset, and the session ended shortly after. This player has also done problem things in the past as well. How do I deal with this? Given it... I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to lay this one in your lap because given your previous answers I think you would have some unique takes on this but I mean I mean the first thing right away is that if he ain't telling you what spell he's casting he ain't casting a spell but <laughs> my benevolence has limits but how how would you handle that if you had a player who is trying to keep secrets from you so they could kind of do cuz it kind of sounds like that that player is trying to set up a gotcha uh, uh, well, See, technically, here's here's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're you're not wrong. It does sound like that. But you know what? I actually hear. Uh, I hear. I hear the gotcha. I hear the potential for. Uh, Aha! I have an idea, and here's mm -hmm. my idea, and it's too late for you, oh most omnipotent being. <laughs> Tough did it. Can't do to it. Stop can't take backs. To stop me. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear. Based on what you've told me. There is the gotcha, but underneath the gotcha, the motivation for the gotcha, to me, mm -hmm. is they have a fear of being told no. Mm. They have a fear of being 
a failure. They have a fear of the DM trying to stop them. Mm. And that comes from perhaps other histories at other tables. Mm -hmm. That comes from a lack of communication between myself, between the DM and the players, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you have that understanding, when you have that understanding, Brian, yes. that I am here to enable your fantasies, truly, that is what I am here to do. Mm -hmm. They're gonna tell you what they wanna cast yeah. because they believe based on your actions and the things that you've done all this time forward, your communication with them, mm -hmm. your desire to understand and be a fan of their characters, to root for them. They know you're not going to try to fuck them. Yeah. Right? If they, they if for me, right, as a lawful neutral DM, they know as long as it checks out by the rules, you've got it. It's, mm -hmm. it's yours. Do it. Let's see it happen. Let's save the commoner. Save your ally. Do whatever. Do have your moment. The camera's on you. So to me, it is tragic. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that, and I think honestly, I think it's I yeah. think it's sad uh, because that could have been a really cool moment, and yep. the player didn't trust the GM. That is what I hear. True. The player didn't trust them. They were, even if they didn't realize it, they were scared of being told no or that uh, the GM would say that they were at a lower depth at the last second, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, oh, your spell goes 120 feet? They're 125, baby. Or, uh, oh, you need this. to see them for the spell? The water's murky, baby. Or, you know, <laughs> any very, like, um, yeah. because, right, because you have infinite power. You can stop me at any moment. I know that. Yeah. I know I can stop you. I don't need to. But make me smile. Let's see what happens. Exactly. That You know, what's interesting is that further down in that thread, the DM who had posted that had said that the player was trying to, and I, now me personally, I love it when the players try to uh, do off-label use of spells. Mm -hmm. I think it's so creative and it's fun. And if, listen, if it's flat out not going to work, I'll tell them, you know, it, it, it's what it's, um, mm, mm, mm. there's four words that every DM will say. If you're trying to do something and you're trying to very, maybe not so subtly tell them that it probably is not going to work, is the, well, you can certainly try, right? <laughs> um, but that was what was happening. The player was trying to do use a spell in a not normal way and was worried the DM was going to say no. And the DM said, I would have let him do it. It's So you're hitting it on the head there where it's just like, it comes back to it, right? Talk to your players, establish some expectations. And I don't know, maybe this DM has been just a, I don't mean this in a negative way, but has been a rules lawyer saying this is what the rules are, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what they're going to be. So, I, I mean, yeah, I don't, there's not enough content, but I think you, you hit it there where it's just like, yeah, communicate. And remember, it's supposed to be fun. Yeah. yeah, like it, it is right, and you're supposed to you you should set that expectation uh, because it it allows for informed consent and it allows mm -hmm. for informed decision making. That's the other component, right? Mm -hmm. If um if I if you know from talking with me and sitting at my table that a ray of frost does not freeze pools of water. Mm -hmm. You don't have an expectation for that to happen. Right. You know that it's not what that spell does. I know it's super cool that that's how it works in Divinity Original Sin 2, but that's not <laughs> how it works. That's not how the spell works. But there might be other things in the world that let you do certain things, right? We might have an artificer that has a freeze bomb. You don't know. The possibilities are both bounded and endless at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it is just an exploration of the, the setting and the world and an understanding of what is and isn't allowed that allows you to make informed decisions. Sure, you may know that that spell that you kind of really hope I'll let you bend the rules for for this cool moment, maybe. Maybe mm -hmm. that might happen. But you know, more often than not, I might turn my nose up at it, me personally. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that I like to have my world function and have the, 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 the game that we're playing function. But you know that going in. Mm -hmm. So maybe you'll just dive in after your friend. And that makes for a different kind of dramatic story, doesn't it? Yes. 
you can still have those outstanding moments and you can have those moments that allow quite frankly if we're talking fifth edition certain kinds of characters who don't really get to shine all that often Mm -hmm. shine all that often it's a nice moment when the barbarian gets to do something that's not just swing their axe True. They get to dive in and save the rogue because they can take the freezing temperatures. They can get down there. They have the con for the breath. They can make it. Yeah. And yeah, you don't get to use your magic this time. I promise you there's going to be 12 more rooms that you can fireball. <laughs> I swear. I will give you plenty of things to set on fire. Don't worry about it. We're talking. It'll be a target rich environment. Just <laughs> always chill. Um, so what's some advice? So as we wrap things up here. What's one tip you would give a brand spanking new, still in the package, mint condition, dungeon master or game master who's about to embark on their very first imaginary journey? What is one tip you would give them? Okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to need a second to think. Okay. Because I don't want to repeat the same things I've already said, because communication would be my number one tip. Right. Having that session zero and establishing what it is that the your your you know uh starter kit box adventure mm-hmm. is going to be about, right? Let them know like what kind of characters to make, all that stuff. Communication would be my normal number one, but I think I've repeated that a fair amount. So let me think of something else. <laughs> no worries. Is. Communication uh, is important. I mean that's I every person i've recorded or or done done this podcast with we've always come to that theme at some point is communicating with your players and the good dms do that and the i don't want to say the bad dms but the not good dms don't i would say um i would say this do not burden yourself with comparison Ah. do not burden yourself with it good one use it it is a tool everything around you can be used to better yourself in a lot of things but also in dming Mm -hmm. understanding the things that mercer or even the other dms perhaps at your table Mm -hmm. do and growing from them taking inspiration from them looking at the things that they do and the way that they do them and trying to understand how they got to that point in thinking and their preparations Mm -hmm. Take inspiration, but do not be burdened by it. Mm. Do Ooh, not think that, is... that you have to be Ooh. the next Matt Mercer. Don't think you have to be uh, the wonderful gentleman from Penny Arcade or from the Adventure Zone or what have you. These guys have a lot of experience and they run the games that they want to run. This is going to be your game. You can be inspired, but you can also develop and create these whole new things just for yourself Mm -hmm. and for the people you're playing with and that is what you should put your focus on do not let yourself be burdened by comparison be like bruce lee man be like water exactly take take what you you get to define what you're everything else behind (laughs) um so what is one tip you would give your younger dm self don't stop playing D and D. Oh my God! Uh, call. Yeah. yeah. Call Watsy and tell them that four E isn't as bad as everyone tells yeah. them it is. I feel uh, seen. <laughs> I, I never played I four E, but I I do f- I feel seen right now. I just because that's yeah. <sighs> it's so much. It's don't nice because re- yeah, don't stop. I, I I like it because now, um. Even if we're on the waning edge of whatever, if this is a, we're going to call it a golden age of D and D and and TTRPG, we, even if we're on the waning side of that particular hill, it's so much easier to play it now. One because of its accessibility, but two because it's lost so much of the uh, negative stereotype that it had. You know, and I mean, for a big thing. Oh, we, the basement stereotype. The basement stereotype. Well, so when I, so, um, it sounds like I have a few years on you. So, um, I <laughs> yeah, when I it's... started playing, it was right in the smack dab in the middle of the Satanic Panic. Mm-hmm. So it was the whole idea that this was evil, and there was like little. I remember at my church growing up, they had these little comics that talked about also. I forget who did them. There's a name for them, but these little comics that were like how 
you know, the world is sin. And one of them was how D&D, and in, in, in the comic, the girl starts playing D&D, but then eventually has to uh, kill her parents so she could become part of the company. <laughs> um, and, but this was the propaganda that was out, you know, is that D&D was this awful satanic thing. So uh, my parents were like, they know it wasn't. They knew it was make-believe, but I did have a friend who was not allowed to play with us because of that. Um, but I think that's also Joe, uh, Joe Mangiello. We can thank him for that. Him and Vin Diesel. Just <laughs> it's like, are you gonna, are yeah. you gonna, are you gonna tell Joe Mangiello it's not cool? Yeah, I want to see that conversation. <laughs> go, go tell Paul White that it's not cool. He plays D and I want to see how that ends ends up for you. <laughs> It'll be pay per view, I'm sure. I would watch it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as we wrap this up, uh, where can people find you? Follow you? Should you so desire? Where should people find the lion? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter, of course, Lionhead underscore gaming, or on uh, Twitch where I, uh, you know, stream my actual plays on Sundays for Heroes of Thylea, and I also play in one of our uh, friends' games that he runs on Thursdays. Uh, I play uh, the wonderful bounty hunter droid RV three PO on shared experience on Tuesdays. Um, so I'm I'm in I'm in various places, mostly on Twitch and Twitter, uh, and you know have my own Discord and all that jazz as well. Good times, man. I cannot thank you enough. This has been. A real nice way to wrap up. A, we're recording this on a Monday, and this is a really nice way to wrap up a Monday, man. I feel rejuvenated. I feel ready for this week. Man. You're ready to play, aren't you? I am ready to do everything right now, man. Dude. Man. It's been a blast. Fist I'm glad. Fire. I appreciate you reaching back out. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Anytime. Well, that's it for this episode of Hidden Roles. Remember, players, if you're in my game or in Lions game and you listened to this podcast, your characters just might get gelatinous cubed. Yeah, that's a thing. We're the Dungeon Masters. We can make it a thing. Please make sure to give us a big old five-star review on whatever platform you happen to be consuming this podcast on. Please follow the Hidden Rolls podcast on Twitter at Hidden underscore Rolls. And you can always give me, Brian Wiggins, a follow at the St. Brian on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>